my name is Marty Otanez. I'm the host of Getting High on Anthropology. This is episode 14. Today we're at Denver Open Media, denveropenmedia.org. If you haven't checked out Denver Open Media, definitely look at the website, come down and visit the facility. It's filled with toys to produce community media or to promote citizen journalism. Uh, there's courses, there's cameras, um, a great support staff here. So I encourage you to check out Denver Open Media. Uh, tonight on the show, we have Jose Santiago. He's a former cannabis worker and a current member of uh, of Homeless Out Loud, Denver Homeless Out Loud. Yes. Uh, welcome to the show, Jose. Uh, so why don't you tell us about your experience as a cannabis worker? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Marty. Uh, my experience as a cannabis worker uh, has been mostly in processing, uh, doing uh, trimmings for different dispensaries around the Denver, greater Denver area. I've uh, been doing it for three years. So um, just to stop you there, mm -hmm. for someone who's never heard of processing or trimming, mm -hmm. like what, do you what did you actually do as a trimmer? Well, as a trimmer, you had to manicure the, the buds, actually the whole product, the raw product, so it's, it's ready to, to, uh, to sell. So what you do in processing is mostly trimming the cannabis flower that is what it's called bud and uh and then it goes to jar and it goes to curing and then it goes to the shelf got it some people may sa say that sounds like a lot of fun yes but is it was it hard for you to do that and if so tell me about the actual work like uh, was it difficult or one thing you liked or didn't like about the job well for me i had experience i had background uh before i came to colorado uh but definitely i, I will say it take a person about four to six hours to get the the whole technique uh, that takes to trim the cannabis. So it, it's one thing about repetition. It's, it's, it's about repetitions. Once you get the you know the feeling, once you get the idea, and uh, once you trim you know for about an hour, then you start improving your your speed. Okay, and you yes. said you had. Um, some prior experience? Did you go through any kind of formal training or how did you get No, uh, actually uh, back in Puerto Rico where I grew up, I used to have friends that had uh, maybe a, a room or two growing and right where they harvest, they used to invite me to their house and we smoke out and we trim their butts. Okay. Yes. And then um, you told me in an earlier conversation that you went to this Oakland-based Oaksterdam. Yes. So what is Oaksterdam and what kinds of courses did you take there? Yeah, in Oaksterdam, I take indoor horticulture. Uh, Oaksterdam is uh, the first university uh, of cannabis in the United States. Actually, uh, in Oaksterdam, uh, was with uh, most of the activists uh, gather and uh, they take the Proposition 215, the one that uh, made possible for California back in 1996. Okay. So that was the beginning of the medical cannabis history uh, as we know nowadays. That was back in 96 in, uh, in California. So you came to Colorado, you had some training from Puerto Rico in yes. Oaksterdam, you got the job. One would think three years working as a trimmer, you'd be pretty, um, um, you'd be a lot, have a lot of money. Yes. So um, discuss the salary or any other thing you wanna share about the job as a, a trimmer or a processor. Well, there's uh, different uh, temp agencies out there that I'll say uh, is an entry level uh, position. And uh, like any other uh, temp agency, uh, they take a cut of your, of your pay. That's, that's what they do. They hire you and they send you to different dispensaries and you do their trimmings and uh, you end up making like nine or $10 an hour. So that, that's, that's uh, a little bit above a minimum wage here in Colorado. And I'll say, uh, yeah, it can be uh, decent if, if you get uh, in a place that you can get good hours. But uh, if, if you're in a situation that you're just doing part time or, or whatever, uh, definitely it's, it's not enough, you know, with the rent now in Colorado and how the, you know, the cost of life is, is increasing. It's very, very uh, hard to just survive in, in that type of job. So would you agree or disagree that the earnings you and maybe others uh, are getting as a trimmer are sort of poverty earnings or are they, um, were you happy with the rate of pay? Definitely uh, below the average, I'll say. 
uh, I think you know it's it's, it's not uh, equil equivalent with the with the kind of money that uh, the corporations are making in the cannabis industry. I think it'll, it, there should be an increase of uh, you know the average wage that they're paying. Uh, I think uh, you know there's many things that, that can be worked out you know for uh, for labor's comps and for labor's rights for for minorities in the industry you know um, I think there should be more more inclusiveness and uh, and definitely uh, it should be a, un a union for for the rights of the workers of the cannabis workers okay I'm glad you mentioned that mm -hmm. um, I want to pick up on that in a minute but I first want to ask you. Um, uh, it seems to me with my initial uh, uh, research into the cannabis sector, uh, people are required to get a badge to work. Yes. And some of the requirements to get a badge are pretty high, you know, no criminal background, and you have to, uh, you know, be like a moral upstanding citizen. Yes. In other words, it's code for mostly white people. Yes. So as a person of color, a Latino man, did you have an experience or two that maybe you felt you weren't treated fairly because of your identity? Oh yes, definitely. That's the main reason why I refuse to work in the industry uh, nowadays uh, is because I work in uh, maybe in uh, 60 different places and in, uh, maybe out, in, out of those 60 different places, like in, uh, in 40, I feel like, uh, like I was uh, being uh, discriminated. I, f I felt like I was racially profiled I think uh, it was hard for me to fit in and uh, to just feel normal. I was seeing just like, you know, the, the different guy and I wasn't able to fit in. So for me, yeah, it was uh, definitely a uh, shocking experience for me. Uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico where there's, you know, basically we are all mixed mm. and there's a lot of uh, inclusiveness. And uh, I wasn't used to uh, just uh, racial profiling and uh, that type of uh, uh, the treatment, the treatment. Well, and the well let me ask you that because I want people to really understand. And I've been very lucky to talk to you a couple times about this. Um, can you point to a specific incident that you uh, felt you were discriminated uh, discriminated against, or there was some kind of racial injustice? Like, take us to one moment if you're comfortable sharing um, one of these moments. Well, yes. Uh, Right now, I have, uh, I have an appeal with the Department of Labor. Uh, I used to work with the uh, dispensary Kind Love, and uh, there was incidents where uh, we have uh, majority white individuals that uh, made uh, racial comments. And, uh, like what kind of racial comments? Racial comments uh, like uh, the N-word in many different, uh, different times. Uh, directed at you? Uh, directed at, at other people. People, but at the same time, people that were they knew they were related to me in some way. How? So I took it as personal because uh, I don't say I, I didn't grow up with that with that word and uh, stuff like speak by the way that I that I speak differently uh, that they point out and they make fun of me in a certain way and uh, I, in some way I feel excluded from certain clique that made me uh, made impossible for me to just have a cohesive relation with my coworkers and be able to you know, keep my job. Mm. So there's many different levels to talk about with what you just said. There's, yes. there's the individuals around the trimming table yes. that you spend a lot of time with them. Yes. Um, you work closely with them, you have a conversation with them, or yes. you don't participate in a conversation. Yes. So that's one level. Yes. The other level is who are the owners and to what extent do they create an environment where there's racial equality or there's some tension. So yes. let's start with let's start with the individuals. Are these who are these other trimmers? Are they uh, Puerto Ricans? Are they coming from other parts of the country? And if so, what's the dynamic? At least as you recall, as you remember. Yes, uh, the dynamic is uh, people coming from the south. A lot of people is coming for the industry, and uh, in Mississippi, we know that there is a lot of white supremacism, and uh, that's where the KKK comes from, and. Uh, a lot of other groups and a lot of people might come with that mentality and uh, thinking that they're gonna be uh, embraced and I think uh, certain dispensaries I think they are embracing them and uh, I feel like uh, these individuals 
uh, when they click and they 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 just trying to push people out uh, is is allowed by by the owners and the management in a certain way. So you find a certain kind of behavior potentially from individuals that come from different parts of the country, yes. maybe the South, yes. where there's. Um, uh, feelings of, 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 of white superiority yes. or white supremacy yes. and you're telling me or suggesting that around the trimming table there was this feeling that you were either excluded because of the person the, the color of your skin or because these people were um, uh, they were like-minded yes. and they had a, a certain view where they excluded you because of the color of your skin is yes. that is that accurate or is that um, like an anomaly do you yes think? I call it a click Mm. A click. It's, uh, if I was a skater and you're a skater, I will hang out to you because you're a skater. Well, it's, if they're white supremacism and they, they like that, so that's how they click. So it's like if you have five people, it's pretty easy to, to make you look bad or turn things against you. Like if you say something, uh, but for example, uh, I was the first one that claimed that I was, feel that I was being racially profiled and I was being bullied by these people, mm -hmm. and uh, they turned everything against me, and, and uh, they, uh, the labor department, uh, they didn't uh, approve my, my unemployment because they put a letter that they fired me because uh, I was the one doing the, the racial comments, and, and, and they put everything like I was being the aggressor when I was the victim. So and why they you, were the aggressors. Why don't you tell us about that? Because a few minutes ago, you were mm -hmm. suggesting there's people around the table, yes. uh, potentially from the South, and of course in Colorado yes. and other places, and then there was this feeling of um, being excluded. Yes. But then there was a letter sent by the company that said you were the one that were dishing out um, negative stereotypes yes. uh, or ra using racial terms that were um, unfair. So why would they, like what happened for them to, to say that you were the one throwing out these um, negative terms? Well, you have to understand that I work in that dispensary for, for about six, seven months. So uh, the tension was building up already, you know, uh, between this months, because uh, I wasn't taking it. You know, uh, I don't take abuse, I don't take bullying. You know, I made myself respect it. And these individuals, you know, whenever they, they came at me, you know, I, I was just not affected because I have, a, I have character. Mm. So that was making them feel even matter because they were not affecting me. So mm. they had to uh, get other individuals involved now because not two or three are able to affect me. So now they need five or six. Mm. So that day uh, we were doing uh, a harvest and uh, we were working on tubs. And uh, there was this tub and there was uh, a coworker that uh, he's African-American and uh, he was stepping on the fan leaves because when do harvest, we put the fan leaves on a tub. And you step on them to flatten and them? And you step on them to flatten them. And it came are to people, my mind. Are people wearing shoes when they do this? Uh, they, yeah, we were tenny, tenny shoes, you know, just stepping on the fan <laughs> leaves, great. you know, smashing them down so we can put more. And uh, it came to my mind when I saw him doing that, it came to my mind the movie Blow, where they have at the, the beginning of the movie, and they're smashing the coca leaves. And, and I thought about that, and I say, oh, wow, you know, it looks like we're in a different plantation. This is a coca plantation. And they put everything against me, and they say that I say the word plantation because the guy was African-American. But never, you know, my grandma was African-American. My cousin is African-American. So they twisted your words yes. and made it seem like you were being racist. Exactly. Okay. You know, and since this, there are five of them, you know, that want to click, they want to make their own click. So it was easier to go to HR and put a, a claim on me, a warning, that, a warning letter that they brought to me and I didn't sign. Mm. I refused to sign because, you know, I understand that they were attacking me and uh, turning things against me. Okay, and I think why this is important is because um, the cannabis industry, uh, many businesses are doing things well, yes. um, but we also want to look um, and be critical to ensure that people are being treated, treated fairly yes. and that um, you know there's diversity and that we celebrate and honor um, different people. Yes. So from what I'm hearing, and we're not sure if your case is an anomaly or if it's happening on a wide scale, but there's definitely a sense where the owners are predominantly white 
We know that there's a couple, you can count on your fingers, people of color that get propped up and say, look at the diversity in the cannabis sector. But on the whole, we can agree, the numbers show most of the owners are Caucasian. Yes. And was that something you felt as an obstacle, or was that just, um, that's just the way things are in our well, capitalist society? most of the owners are Caucasian, and if, if you're not Caucasian, and you're there, and you don't act Caucasian, then you're not able to be there, plain and simple. So it, it's, for me, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not about being aggressive. It's about defending myself against discrimination and ba against systemic racism, because all this stuff uh, exists in the industry. So what one change would you like to see to bring parity or to bring racial, racial justice in the cannabis sector in Colorado? I would like the Marijuana Enforcement Division to do a full investigation in every dispensary and to check on their uh, requisites or the requirements. their requirements uh, to get a badge and to make it more affordable for an underprivileged person and to focus in that people that really need the job, not just people that want a job because want to be cool, you know, focus on the people that really can be included and they can maybe get out of uh, harsh situations like homeless individuals, like uh, ex-felons, like nonviolent offenders, that they need jobs, they need a decent job. So this is important um, only because you mentioned um, to make it accessible. So the MED is the agency that issues the badges, yes. and you need a badge to work in a facility. Yes. So um, what's the cost of the badge? The cost is uh, $150. Okay. And uh, it goes to your background check. It's a universal background check, and it's very extensive. And uh, you might have a chance if you have an arrest or a, or a felony, uh, but it's under discretion. Mm. Uh, so they have a little, uh, they can be flexible. They can be flexible, but at some point, if it's a, a drug felony, it does exclude you. It can be nonviolent, and that's where I'm at. There's nonviolent offenders that they deserve a chance to. Got it, and especially if it was for possession and use of marijuana, exactly. which now people are- With what morals you are telling that person that you're not gonna hire because maybe they come from a different area code and you're, you see the privilege, right? It sounds very well planned. Yes. So would you agree or disagree that the workforce, um, the men and women that um, devote their labor to cannabis, that that workforce should reflect the population of Colorado? Yes, sir. It's the areas of the dispensary is very important that uh, they hire, you know, uh, accordingly to the population. So um, really powerful stuff. Um, let's take a little break. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about um, some of the work you're doing in advocacy with Denver Homeless Out Loud. Sure. Uh, I just want to remind people we're with Jose Santiago. He's a former cannabis worker and a current member of Homeless Denver Homeless Out Loud. Uh, my name is Marty Otanez. This is Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, welcome back. My name is Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology. Um, you can find us on the web, www.fsngreen.org. Uh, tonight we have Jose Santiago, a former cannabis um, worker and a current member and advocate with Denver Homeless Out Loud. So, Jose, um, what is the connection for you between uh, being a cannabis worker and then kind of shifting gears and being an active member of Denver Homeless Out Loud? Well, Denver Homeless Out Loud is an advocacy group uh, for the formerly homeless and uh, currently homeless individuals. And, uh, and I believe in Denver Homeless Out Loud because it's, 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 it's something uh, very honest. It's, uh, it's advocacy for human rights. And at the same time, for me, it's an outlet because it, it, it opens uh, a variety of, of, of outlets and media uh, for me to expose, you know, uh, what it's what the reality is 
of uh, individuals that come here, uh, that come to join an industry and they found themselves unable to get a job or unable to get housing and they end up homeless. And actually that was my case three years ago when I first came to Colorado, I was homeless and I uh, got the luck to get a job and got out of homelessness. But many other people, uh, they just got stuck because of a uh, lack of opportunities. And I believe uh, with Denver Homeless Out Loud, uh, I'm able to uh, make myself heard uh, and, and be loud about it. You know, uh, bring awareness, uh, expose the real situation. So um, what's interesting about your background is um, you had a, a revelation. You had a moment in the back of a bus yes. on the way from Littleton um, and you were first introduced to Denver Homeless Out Loud. What happened that day on the back of the bus and how did it shift the, the trajectory, the life changes in, 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 um, in, in your life? Yes. Or the direction uh, of your life? Yeah, actually I was in Littleton that day because I was paying my rent. Uh, I live in uh, South Denver area and uh, the management company is in Littleton, uh, sadly for me, I had to go all the way down there. <laughs> and uh, I was just paying my rent and I uh, hop on the bus and uh, I saw this guy on the back of the bus and I look at him and, hey, you know, uh, how are you? Good, how are you? And I sit on the back of the bus and uh, spent like five minutes thinking about this guy and then he looked at me and he gave me a, a paper. And it was the out loud paper, get loud paper uh, the Denver Homeless Out Loud, uh, uh, you know, uh, distribute, you know, uh, on the monthly basis, and it tells the story of Denver Homeless Out Loud. And I start reading it and, it, and it's like, oh, wow, all this is me. This is me right here. And uh, you, wanna, I, you wanna be more specific? Like, what did you see in the paper that you made the click between you and the paper? Yes, because it's for the formerly homeless, and this is where I come, and it's for, ho for homeless, currently homeless individuals, it, and it's, it's for advocacy. And that's what I've been trying to do. Mm. You know, that's, that's what keeps me, keeps me away every night, you know, all this time, because I, ca I can see the exclusion that the cannabis industry is doing. And, and, and I see all these individuals, I, I see along the increase of the homeless population, and, I, and I've been trying to do something. I've been trying to get back to the community. And this, 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 this paper opened the, the chance for me to do just that. OK, so you got involved. And then what now is your current involvement with Denver Homeless Out Loud? Yeah, it's, uh, it's advocacy. And uh, I, I do activism. You know, uh, we, we promote uh, uh, an equal opportunity. Uh, for for every member, you know, it's a non-jerarchical uh, group, so everybody has uh, has a word, and uh, mostly, you know, take action against the the oppressive government, right. and uh, and bring awareness about the the whole gentrification issue, the 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 right to rest issue, the whole sweep situation in, in downtown. That is, uh, it's a, it's an issue of human rights. It's a matter of human rights. Uh, there's a lot of sleep deprivation between the homeless population right now in Denver because of the sweepings. Yeah. So uh, we uh, also promote the the right to rest. Okay. And uh, the tiny home villages, the the building of tiny home villages is very important uh, for a self-sustainable uh, community. So I want to make sure viewers know that they can learn more about Denver Homeless Out Loud. Uh, you can visit the website, yes. denverhomelessoutloud.org. You can meet people like Jose and others. Yes. Um, so was it hard for you to leave the cannabis sector? And then uh, why, why, like explain just briefly, why did you leave and was it hard for you? Uh, for me, it wasn't hard for me. I was just uh, tired of, of being, of feeling discriminated and tired of feeling oppression and tired of uh, just doing my best uh, so I can get a, a better position, but then being uh, jumped, I say skipped in a certain way. You mean in terms of um, advancement, job advancement? Job advancement, like uh, I feel like I got stuck in the entry level position because I wasn't able to make a click necessarily because I'm not that kind of person. I'm a very uh, honest person and I try to be uh, as, as honest as possible 
and uh, it wasn't I wasn't being able to be me in that environment. So I was tired of the same same situation uh, in different places, and uh, and yeah, I refused to work in the industry until uh, you know the law, you know the discrimination laws are being put in place because I don't think right now it's going on. Yeah. So you did something very dramatic. Yes. You not only left. Uh, the cannabis sector, yes. but symbolically, you did something to show your frustration. So yes. tell people what happened to your badge and why did you do this to your badge? Yes, uh, I was at a fair chance uh, event. Uh, it's basically uh, for it was for people that's being excluded, uh, for ex felons that being excluded to get a job, for uh, people that have backgrounds and they, they, they're excluded of, of getting a job, just getting a, a normal job. And uh, I heard the panel talking, you know, about how just one, one time after the other, they get denied of getting a job. And uh, I start feeling that I was promoting that because I work in an industry that is, there is, uh, that is closing the doors on, on nonviolent offenders, that is closing the door on, on minorities and that is closing the door to underprivileged individuals that are not able to afford $150 to get a badge, mm. that are not able to have a pristine background check because they being oppressed. Right. Or maybe because they, they come from out of state, they've been prosecuted in a different area code. So at that meeting, um, you learned a bit about this organization, and, yes. and you you physically took out your card and ripped it up. Yes, what, what, yes, yeah. What makes, was the reason you ripped your card? It, it was for me uh, breaking the the the, the chains because I felt like I was enslaved in a certain way, and I wasn't able to just be me. So for me, in that moment, says I'm not going to promote this anymore. I refuse to work in this industry until I see something different, until I see inclusiveness until I see discrimination laws be put in place. And uh, for me, that moment of uh, tearing, up, tearing apart the badge, it was for me, was breaking the chains. Um, um, thank you, I'm glad you mentioned that. We just have a, a few minutes left. So briefly, dis, um, discuss the project that you shared with me um, earlier called Into the Light. Into the Light uh, is basically a transitional, transitional program a reintegration program for uh, for homeless individuals and uh, for for people that wants to transition into have a normal life, a social life, uh, basically have a place to to live and uh, and have a, have a job, uh, a stable job, having a stable housing, and uh, being mentored. Uh, for me, means. Uh, being able to to wake up every day and go to work and and have you know the the certainty that you're gonna have a place to go that for me is into the light okay so I hope um, if there's a chance in the future to have you back on the show yes. or to at least maybe visit you at Denver homeless out loud yes um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in my name is Marty Otanias uh, this is getting high on anthropology and you can find us at www.fsngreen.org and please check out Denver homeless out loud that's Denver homeless out loud.org have a great night <laughs>